So to this point, we've been talking about reproduction. We've defined what reproduction is, some of the general patterns in reproduction. We talked about the role of mitosis and meiosis in reproduction. We've begun talking about some of the variation reproductive life strategies and life cycles. And the last lecture was about the importance of fertilization and dispersal and some of the adaptations that organisms have for fertilization and dispersal and the costs and benefits associated with those adaptations and fertilization dispersal in general. So we talked about that stuff in animals and now we're going to move on to talk about that stuff in plants. And just as a hot tip for all of this, I'm going to move through it pretty quickly. There's great information in your textbook chapter on plant reproduction about all the stuff that I'm talking about. So I would highly, highly recommend checking out that chapter as well. So when we talk about fertilization and dispersal, just as a reminder, fertilization is the jo joining of gametes like egg and sperm. And dispersal is just the movement or spread of offspring or other life stages to new areas. And the real challenge for plants is that they have to figure out how to do both of these things, join egg and sperm from two different individuals and move from place to place without being able to move. So obviously this cartoon is a bit of a joke. Like obviously plants are not able to move around like that. So they have to figure out how to do all of these things without being able to move. And the way they do that is basically exploiting water, wind, and animals. So let's talk a little bit more about the adaptations they have to do that. And we're going to be talking about first fertilization and then dispersal. And we'll be talking about examples of adaptation specifically in the land plants. And hopefully you can remember when I'm talking about land plants, I'm talking about the plants featured in this phylogenetic tree right here. So that's things like bryophytes that you see right here. So things like mosses, things like ferns and their allies. So that's here on the tree. Things like the gymnosperms, so gymnosperms are right here on this tree, so these are things that produce cones, so these like the pine trees, and angiosperms that are the flower producing plants. So we're going to talk about the adaptations they have for fertilization and dispersal, starting with fertilization. And remember that all of these organisms are capable of sexual reproduction, and so their job is to figure out ways to produce and connect sperm and eggs. That's what fertilization is doing, so how do they connect them? And there's a nice little figure in your text that basically breaks this down, the major adaptations that they have to connect egg and sperm. And one of the big sort of things to draw away from this, and I'll go into the details of it in a bit, is that these groups, the ferns and the bryophytes, depend on water to move sperm around, whereas the gymnosperms and angiosperms have evolved pollen, which allows them to transfer sperm through the air, so they're less water dependent for fertilization. So let's first look at the bryophytes, ferns, and allies. So here we're looking at these groups. So things like mosses, things like ferns, this stuff here on this phylogenetic tree. Those are the bryophytes, ferns, and allies. And as I said before, they depend on water for fertilization. And that's because they only produce sperm, and those sperm have to swim to the egg. So the sperm have a little flagella on them, and they need water to be able to swim through the water to reach an egg. And that means that they're really dependent on being in very moist habitats. If there's not water around in the environment readily for sperm to swim through, they're not going to be able to fertilize. So let's look at this as the actual sort of life cycle that um, bryophytes depend on. And so let's just for now in this life cycle concentrate on this stage right here. So this is a life stage called the gametophyte. And when you think of a moss, that's the life stage you're looking at, this thing called the gametophyte. And gametophyte just means that phyte means plant, and gameto means gamete producing. And so this is the life stage, the moss life stage, that produces gametes, like eggs and sperm. And so there's male and female mosses, and they have these little sort of sex organs that are clustered at the top. And some of the male plants will produce sperm, the female plants will produce eggs, and sperm will swim through the water to fertilize the egg. Um, to make this other life stage that's called the sporangium. And that sporangium will eventually reduce, produce these things called spores that will grow into the gametophytes and the life stage produces. But the big thing to draw away from this at this point is that the sperm are produced on one plant and the sperm have to swim through water to reach an egg. And so once again, they're depending on moisture and moist environments. And that's why you only tend to see mosses and ferns in moist environments because of that need for water for fertilization and survival. So now let's now switch gears a little bit and we'll talk about the gymnosperms and angiosperms. 
and how they fertilize. So when we're talking about gymnosperms and angiosperms, we're talking about cone-bearing plants and flower-bearing plants. So things like pine trees, things like rose bushes and other plants that make flowers, okay? So both gymnosperms and angiosperms produce pollen. So that means mosses, ferns, and all the allies do not produce pollen. Pollen is unique. It's a unique trait that defines or partially defines the gymnosperms and angiosperms. And pollen is a multicellular, so it's made of multiple cells, desiccation resistant, so desiccation just means drying out, so they resist drying out, plant life stage for the transport of sperm through the air. So a pollen grain is a multicellular life stage. It's almost like a little organism, and that organism produces sperm, and it can produce this little thing called a pollen tube to sort of transfer sperm from this life stage to other life stages. And this is just a blow up, a sort of greatly um, uh, magnified image of what some pollen granules look like. And one of the important sort of take-homes from this is that pollen helps prevent desiccation and the movement of sperm without water. So pollen are so small that they can fly through the air and they have this sort of coat around them that stops them from drying out. And so this allows the gymnosperms and angiosperms to do fertilization independent of water. Another really important point that I want to drive home here is that pollen are not the same thing as sperm. So just like Colin over here on the left, Colin Jost is a multicellular organism that is capable of producing sperm. Pollen is also a multicellular organism that is capable of producing sperm. So calling pollen the same thing as sperm is the same thing as calling Colin the same thing as sperm. So try to avoid making that uh, common misconception. Okay, so let's talk about fertilization specifically in gymnosperms. So gymnosperms, remember one of the defining features of the gymnosperms is they produce cones. So pine trees are an example of gymnosperms. And cones um, produce pollen and cones are really a specialization for wind pollination. And so there's male and female cones. Male cones make lots of pollen and then what happens is wind carries that pollen through the air to female cones. So these female cones if you look inside of them, those female cones make eggs, so they have these little scales inside of them. Inside of those scales are ovules, and inside of those ovules are individual eggs. And so the male pollen will fly, it'll sort of connect with those scales, it'll send this little pollen tube out, so remember it makes this pollen tube with sperm in it, and the sperm will fertilize the egg in the female cone. And that will eventually give rise to seeds. Okay, and so the important sort of take home from this is that gymnosperms and all gymnosperms use pollen and wind pollination and therefore they don't depend on water for fertilization so they're able to survive in much drier habitats. Now let's look at fertilization in the angiosperms, okay? So remember the defining characteristic or major defining characteristic of the angiosperms is they produce flowers and flowers are capable of making both pollen and or eggs. And so this is an example of a perfect flower, a perfect flower because it can produce both sperm and eggs or pollen and eggs. And you have these male parts called the stamen that you're looking at here that's made of a filament and an anther. I wouldn't expect you to memorize these terms like stamen, anther, filament, stigma style, carpal, but I do want you to understand that there's these sort of male parts and then these sort of female parts. So the carpal makes up the female parts with a sigma style and ovary. So once again, you don't have to remember all these terms, just under that there's understand there's male parts on a flower, if it's a perfect flower, and female parts on a flower. And those male parts, so the anther produces lots of pollen, and once again, those pollen will produce sperm, and then those pollen can fly sort of off the flower and land on the female parts of another flower, and then that pollen grain will send down a pollen tube with sperm in it, that pollen tube will fertilize this egg or the ovules that are inside the female parts. And once that ovule is fertilized, the ovule becomes the seed and the carpal, so the sort of tissue that's surrounding it, will fatten up and fill up with sugars or fats or whatever it is, some sort of meaty flesh that becomes the fruits. And so fruits are something that are unique to the angiosperms, having the sort of flesh around it to carry and surround the seed and entice things to eat and take the seed. So an important part of angiosperms is flower production. Remember that flowers make pollen and that's all part of fertilization. 
And those flowers are specialized oftentimes to attract pollinators. So they can have special colors or shapes to bring in bees. They can have special sort of scents and open up at certain times to bring in bats. They can have lots of yummy nectar and sort of shapes to attract hummingbirds and all types of different animal pollinators. And the whole point here is all of those things are evolutionary tricks that flowers have evolved to sort of bring these pollinators in get them to get pollen all over them, and then move that pollen to the next flower. And so this is a much more sort of efficient way of moving pollen around instead of sending a bunch out into the environment to just float around. It'll go to a particular animal that'll visit one flower and then take that pollen directly to another flower. And so angiosperms and flowers, one of their big sort of goals here is to get animals to move their pollen for them. Um, there are some angiosperms that also depend on wind dispersal for their pollen. But one of the big sort of take homes here is that angiosperms, like the gymnosperms, because they have pollen, they don't depend on water for fertilization, or they're way, way, way less directly dependent on water for fertilization. Okay, which of the following is false? Okay, if you said that bryophytes and ferns produce pollen, that is correct. Bryophytes and ferns do not produce pollen. Only angiosperms and gymnosperms are capable of producing pollen. Bryophytes and ferns produce sperm, not pollen. Another important point that I want to drive home here is that this point here, E and C and E, are really important sort of general trends to pick up on, is that pollen helps angiosperms and gymnosperms produce in drier habitats. And so they can survive in drier environments and therefore be in more habitats where bryophytes and ferns, because they depend on water for fertilization, it limits them really to wetter habitats. And if you think about the areas where you tend to see ferns and mosses, it tends to be in sort of wetter, cooler areas. Okay, so now let's talk about dispersal in the land plants. So remember, dispersal is all about how do you move a full plant from one place to another. Okay, so the bryophytes, the ferns, and the allies are exclusively wind dispersed, and they use something called spores to move from point A to point B. And spores are just haploid unicellular structures that behave similar to seeds in the sense that um, they're used for dispersal, but it's important to note that spores are different than seeds. And so this little image that you're looking at here with this capsule and all this sort of stuff flying out of it, that's an example of moss spores flying through the air, being wind dispersed. And all this stuff here, so this is a fern, you can see it's got all these little sort of dots right here, those produce spores. And these are all the spores after you laid that fern out and it laid all the sort of spores down and made this spore print here. So here you can see an actual moss life cycle. And if we look at this thing, this is a sporangium. This basically grows out the top of what a typical moss plant. A little capsule opens up and all these spores get released. And remember, these are haploid unicellular structures. And basically, they act similar to seeds, though they are different to seeds, where they disperse to a new place. If they land in the right habitat, they'll sprout and grow these little mature gametophyte plants. And this is what you typically think of with moss, okay? So an important point to drive home is, number one, spores are not pollen. Spores and pollen are different things. Pollen is multicellular. Pollen produces sperm. Spores are unicellular. Spores do not produce sperm directly. And spores also are different than seeds because seeds are multicellular structures and they are typically diploid or even triploid. Okay, so let's look at dispersal in gymnosperms and angiosperms. Now, gymnosperms and angiosperms have a unique structure that they've evolved, and that's seeds. So seeds are only present in gymnosperms and angiosperms. And seeds are distinct from spores in the sense that seeds are multicellular, and they are not haploid. There are a few exceptions to that, but for the most part, seeds are multicellular. And so here we're looking at a picture of a seed right here, and you can see that this seed has a little embryo in it, a multicellular embryo that's diploid. It has this protective seed coat that keeps it from drying out that's diploid. And in the case of angiosperms, it also has this sort of nutritive tissue called endosperm that's actually triploid. I don't care about you knowing so much about, you know, what's diploid versus triploid, but I do want you to understand that a seed is multicellular and that it is not, no part of this angiosperm seed is haploid like you would see in spores. Now, the way a seed is 
formed is basically, you know, here we're looking at the female parts of a flower. A little sperm lands on this little top part of the flower. It sends this little pollen tube down that's got sperm in it. The pollen tube basically goes into this little egg that's like in here in the lower part of the female part of the flower. That egg gets fertilized, and when it gets fertilized, that egg turns into this seed that we're looking at here. So seeds, remember, they're multicellular, not haploid. Seeds, they have this protective coat that keeps them from drying out. So if you think of a sunflower seed, when you pop the little like uh, salty top part of a sunflower seed open, um, that is that protective coat that keeps it from drying out that you're popping open. And then you get the sunflower seed out, and that seed itself that you're eating, that's the nutritive tissue. And that tissue is meant to sort of initially feed a growing embryo. So this is the actual plant that's inside and surrounded by that nutritive tissue in the seed. And that little diploid multicellular embryo eventually grows up into a big plant. And so you can see here, if you get some uh, fresh peanuts, sometimes you can crack them in half and you can even see the little embryo of a plant, a peanut plant, growing inside of that seed. Now interestingly, or maybe not interestingly, but gymnosperms, they're called gymnosperms because gymno means naked, sperm means seed. It's because they have naked seeds, and so there's no fruit surrounding the seeds in gymnosperms. They're always these sort of dryish looking seeds with just the nutritive tissue around them. Whereas angiosperms, angio basically, uh, angiosperm basically translates to vesseled seeds. And so vesseled seeds means that there's a vessel around them. In other words, they have fruit around them. So this avocado, it has that sort of fleshy stuff around it. And think of any fruit like an apple, like an orange, um, all of those fruits have seeds surrounded by this sort of sweet tissue. And the whole point there is there's a sweet tissue surrounding the seed so that an animal will be attracted to it to come and eat it. They'll eat that seed and then as they sort of run around to a new place, they'll poop the seed out later and that helps the organism to be dispersed through these seeds, okay? And so any seed or fruit um, it can be, some can be wind dispersed, like uh, if you think about the seeds on a dandelion or on a maple tree, um, they can be animal dispersed. So if you have like yummy fruits that, you know, mice will eat and go and stash in places or a bird will eat this yummy fruit and then it'll fly to another spot and poop it out. Or um, they can be dispersed through burrs like this dog here that's got all his burrs stuck to its ear. The point is all of these things help to move these seeds and plants around over long distances. And some plants can also be water dispersed, um, or angiosperms can be water dispersed, like this coconut here. So coconuts will float in the water, float off to another island, and then grow. So there's lots of different ways that plants can be dispersed, and seeds help with that process, okay? And so if you sort of summarize this across all of the land plants, um, you can see these sort of general trends where for fertilization, um, the bryophytes, and the ferns and allies all depend on water for fertilization, whereas the gymnosperms and angiosperms have pollen, and so they're basically um, depending on, or they can be uh, fertilized through the air. So animals can also move pollen through the air, but the point is they can be moved through the air. And if you look at dispersal, um, these plants, so the bryophytes and the ferns and allies, have spores that allow them to be dispersed through the air. And these uh, gymnosperms and angiosperms have um, seeds that allow them to be dispersed through the air. And that is to say, you know, they can travel on or in animals, but ultimately they are deep independent or able to transfer independent of water. And what you see over time here is these adaptations like spores, seeds, and pollen allow organisms, um, allow these plants over time, um, these traits that have evolved have allowed them to move from wetter and wetter habitats to drier and drier and more terrestrial habits, habitats, such as the gymnosperms and angiosperms can survive in very, very dry habitats that don't have a lot of water because they don't rely on water for fertilization and dispersal. Okay, so which of the following is true? All right. If you said that gymnosperms and angiosperms can fertilize and disperse independent of water, that is the correct statement. This is a little bit of a strong statement in the sense that, you know, gymnosperms and angiosperms still need some water to survive in general, 
but for fertilization and dispersal specifically, they don't need water to do just those particular things. Um, so what's wrong about these other ones? It's really important anytime you work through these questions, you figure out what are the things, what are the reasons that the other ones are wrong. Um, so ferns and bryophytes depend on water for fertilization. That is true, but they don't depend on water for dispersal because they can use spores that can disperse through the air. Gymnosperms and angiosperms uh, use pollen, not spores for fertilization and seeds for dispersal. That part is right. Ferns and bryophytes do not use pollen for fertilization. They use sperm for fertilization. So pollen is a trait that's unique to the gymnosperms and the angiosperms, and they use spores for dispersal, not seeds. Seeds are a trait that are, that's unique to the gymnosperms and the angiosperms. Pollen and spores play the same general role in dispersal. That's not true. So pollen, remember, pollen produces sperm. Pollen is all about fertilization, not for dispersal. Whereas spores, they play a role in dispersal and they're not really playing a role in fertilization, at least not directly. And then spores and seeds are the same thing. So spores and seeds are similar in the sense that they're both used for dispersal. But remember, spores are unicellular and haploid, whereas seeds are multicellular, and they are not haploid. They're typically diploid and can occasionally have triploid tissues as well.